All right, then um, let's get to it for this morning so you guys can get out there and enjoy the day. Um, I will share my screen. There we go. And then we can take a look at uh, question eight. So we went over last time one through seven for your assignment. <clears throat> and I wanted to hold off on question eight. Um, just so you'd have a chance if you were in my lecture to talk about the integrated rate laws. And um, so anyway, question eight for uh, this report, let's see. Uh, on the spreadsheets, just to refresh your memory what that is. All right, so here's all the tutorial section that teaches you, uh, unless you already knew how to do a lot of things in Excel. And then right here is the assignment. You're supposed to get this file, which is posted in Canvas along with this experiment. Um, and in, in this assignment, you were to do these things. And we talked about, like I was saying, one through seven last time. So you can check out that video. Unless you have a question now on any of these. A anybody have a question on one through seven of the assignment? Not really. Okay, good. Uh, and so that assignment, thats I have that posted due for uh, Sunday night. But if you need another day or two or you want to talk in person on Monday and, and hand it in a little late, that's not a problem either. <clears throat> but I don't want to, you know, go over and over that uh, too much. Uh, all right, number eight. This part is kind of like your uh, report all in one. So it ties it up with uh, lecture. Anyway, it says this part you can uh, type up in a, a Word document or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing it starts off with purpose section. What's the purpose of this activity or this lab, this online lab? If we were allowed to meet we would be meeting in the computer room on the fourth floor of the, of the math and science building. It's the chemistry computer room. And we would be discussing this in, in person. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the first question is, uh, write a couple paragraphs and talk about the purpose. And there's, I think there's many purposes to this lab. The obvious one is, uh, for you guys to get comfortable using Excel uh, as a tool to help you analyze experimental data that you might get in the chemistry lab. Uh, another uh, purpose of this experiment, since this is our first one, I think, is to see how well you can read and follow instructions. You know, for example, uh, if you go back to any one of these uh, things here where it says uh, enter your name and, and adjust the column, uh, the time column to the tenths place, you know, I just go through and check that to see if you can read it and do what it says. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, that's another purpose. Uh, and then uh, a big purpose of this lab, I think, is to use the data that you're given and tie it to the lecture material uh, on rate laws and integrated rate laws. So that's the, the third. So it, it, it ties in the kinetics for lecture. So there's at least three purposes that I could think of offhand that you can uh, talk about in 8A. 
Uh, and as as usual, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Um, uh, otherwise, I'll just continue. All right, so 8B, the order of reaction section. This section is an analysis concerning the order of the decomposition data given in that spreadsheet, the, the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this is to include a statement of which type the reaction order is and why you've come to the conclusion. Use the words integrated rate law in your explanation. All right, so you know from lecture, I assume uh, a lot of you guys are in my lecture, uh, some of you guys are not. And so I don't know, uh, out of all you guys out there, um, is anybody not talked about integrated rate laws? My lecture hasn't. Oh, okay. Um, all right, then let, let's do a, a quick recap on the integrated rate law. Uh, let's see. Um, there we go. Uh, all right, so you know what rate laws are. Uh, I assume that you at least got through that part uh, in your lecture, is that true? Rate laws, you guys? I know I have. Yeah, um, I have. Okay, good. So um, rate laws are these mathematical equations that relate the rate of a chemical reaction to the initial concentrations of any of the reactants. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to try to write on here and squeeze it up to the uh, up top here. So if I have a reaction, just say a simple reaction where I have A going to B. Um, as soon as I see that written down, I can write the form of the rate law. And the rate law shows how concentration, the initial concentration of a reactant affects rate. So the rate law is rate. And remember, that's got to be in units of molarities per second, or in most cases. And that's found equal to um, K, the rate constant, which has units that change. And the units of K are such that uh, the rate always comes out in molarities per second. So the units of K depend on the overall order. Now, anybody out there, can you tell me what comes next for the rate law? The concentration of whatever's in the reaction. To okay, beta. What, what's in the reaction? Uh, let's see. A and B? Yeah, we're using this reaction here. Oh, okay. Right, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so A is the reactant and B is the product. So what do I have to put here? That would be A. That's correct. Because this is a rate law um, for initial concentrations of only reactants, remember? Now, what am I missing so far? The exponent. Yeah, so I can label this as Y or Z or anything. We often put an X there. It's unknown. That's the power dependency. Uh, what can uh, X be? Well, in my lecture, it could be really any number, but usually it's one, two, or three, or zero, one, or two, excuse me. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. That's, uh, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so it can be negative or fractional, but in Chem 201, we normally just deal with zero first and second order for that power dependency. And since this only has one reactant, we only have one term here. Uh, uh, if it had others, it's no big deal. We would just put those other ones over here and uh, keep on going, okay? But it doesn't. Uh, all right, so, now, what does the units of K depend on? We just said it, remember? 
the units. Oh, the units of K would depend on, yeah, like, uh, so whatever um, M and whatever, like, cancels out, like, whatever works with, like, the um, R, basically. Y yes, that's correct. So um, the units of K depend on the overall power uh, dependencies. So we don't have a term here, so we don't have to worry about that one. So in this case, uh, it, it depends on the overall order. So if X is zeroth order, then K has to carry the units of molarities per second because anything to the zeroth power is one. And so this whole term drops out here. But if it's the first order, then it has a molarity unit. And so for first order, uh, the units of K would be just one over seconds because there's already going to be a molarity from this term. And then second order, it changes and so forth. The second order, you're going to have to put an M down here to cancel out one of those. Right? So the, the key is that the rate always has to have units of molarities per second. All right, so that's kind of the quick and, and dirty thing about the rate law, uh, a little recap. Um, one, as soon as you know, or as soon as somebody has defined what the reactants are, you know the form of the rate law. So you can write it down, and then you just have to determine in that rate law, the power dependencies, if there's more than one reactant, as well as the rate constant. And then that defines your rate law and that will tell you for any initial concentration that you have in any experiment that you did or will do in the future, if you know that concentration and you know the rate law, then you'll know the rate of that reaction. So the rate laws are pretty cool, they're pretty powerful, um, but you should know that they only deal with changes in concentration because we've fixed everything else. We fix the temperature. We make sure there's no changes in pressure or surface area. We don't add a catalyst. <clears throat> so as long as everything else is constant, we make this proportionality constant and we call it the rate constant K. Uh, all right, so um, that's pretty much uh, the rate law. Uh, any questions on that? Okay, good. You don't have yeah. to understand the math behind all this, right? It's it's kind of like, it, there's not much math behind the rate law. It's, um, it's derived in, in a, a similar fashion that uh, you derive the uh, ideal gas law, for example. Mm -hmm. here, here, do you remember that? Did we ever go over that? Uh, yeah kind of yeah because i like to use that as the analogy right because you have that um experimental evidence how uh pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles it's indirectly proportional to the volume it's directly proportional to the temperature right and these are Boyle's law law of gay lussac and so forth all these laws you put them together you get the ideal gas law as long as you leave everything else constant, then you could make that proportionality into a constant. We call that R, the ideal gas law constant. And it's the same kind of idea, this derivation of this mathematical equation. It comes from experience, pretty much, an experiment on how things behave. Yeah, because all the derivations on like the next couple of pages all use like calculus and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Now we're going to get to that. Okay. So now I see where you're going. Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, right. So oh, I, not much math. Are you serious? <laughs> well, well, yeah, right. Not, not in the derivation of this. We yeah. didn't use much math. Yeah. Okay. In the derivation of the integrated rate laws. Yeah. Then you're going to need to know calculus. Professor, real quick. Um, so for first order, K is to the, is seconds to the minus one, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just like it says down here, if you look at this chart from, from our lecture, 
uh, for first order, K's units is one over seconds. And if it's second order, then it's one over molarity seconds. And of course, if it's zeroth order, it's molarity per second. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it's kind of weird uh, because uh, the, the units of K change and, and uh, you don't come across that very often. But anyway, in this theory, in this rate law, where we attempt to um, track changes in the rate of a chemical reaction based solely just on concentration changes of reactants. That's it, right? I start with some initial concentration. And if I know that concentration and I know the rate law, then I know the rate of the reaction. So it's derived from experiment, but it's pretty powerful. So there's no, you know, calculus or anything like that. That's what I mean by uh, the derivation uh, uh, didn't use much math. It's more concepts. Uh, anyway, now we have this mathematical formula and we can use it uh, like we just mentioned. All right, well, we can derive from these different, uh, you know, orders or dependencies of concentration on rate, we can derive from these, right, where the rate equals all of these things, depending on the order, we can derive using calculus and integration, which you guys are not uh, responsible to know at this point in your career. So we just give them to you. We just give you these integrated rate laws. Um, <clears throat> and now what happens is you take a, uh, an equation that talks about the rate of a chemical reaction, right? This is the rate here, uh, with respect to changes in concentration of reactants over here. Okay. You take an equation like that, then you integrate it, you know, you stick it in some magic box and out pops different equations that no longer involve the rate. What these equations involve is time, which there's no time over here in this equation, and the evolution or the change of concentration in that time. So these integrated rate laws are uh, functional forms with an infinite number of points. So for example, for, for the, um, the zeroth order integrated rate law, let me uh, show you what the subscripts mean. Here, this is the concentration of A at some time in the future, T. So that's time in the future. So uh, you, you start an experiment, you start the stopwatch, and the initial time is zero. Uh, and then it, the time starts ticking off into the future and that concentration will change. These integrated rate laws will tell you what the concentration is at any point in time in the future. So you can see the, the value of the integrated rate law. You can track changes in concentration of some reactant. And if I can find out that concentration, what it is at any point in time, then I know how it changed, and then I can use the, um, the relationships for the, the rate of change of any one of the components in a, in a chemical reaction. But anyway, I'm going off on other things. Uh, all right, so let's go back to the equation. So this first term gives me the concentration at time t that's found equal to minus that rate constant, that's the same rate constant here in the, uh, the rate law, uh, times the time in the future, so how long that reaction has been going. Uh, and you have to add to it this initial concentration. So notice, you know, you start out with some initial concentration of A, 
And as time goes on, T is going to get bigger. K is always positive. And we got a negative sign out there. So this is going to eat away or subtract from this term. And you're going to get what that concentration is at any point in time. Any questions on you know, what the, those uh, symbols mean in these integrated rate laws? All right. So there are infinite point functions, right? Now, if the, um, the order is first order in the behavior of how concentration affects the rate, then you get a different integrated rate law that says the log of the concentration versus time is going to be the function that's going to give you uh, a straight line or um, a linear relationship where this term here now is the y and t again is the x just like it was up here y and x but if it's second order the integrated rate law says that concentration is going to evolve uh, in time with a one over concentration function where one over t is found um, relate or related to the uh, time t i'm sorry one over concentration in in this form here so this tells us how concentration should change in time um, for a second order relationship, all right? And these are, like I said, an infinite point function. All, all three of these guys. Namely, they got a dependent variable, y, and an independent variable, x. You tell me X or any time, and I put it into the equation, and I tell you what the concentration is. All right? So these are all infinite points, infinite point functions. And one point, one X, Y point, or one concentration time point is called uh, the half-life. And I'll leave that for lecture. So that's one of the points. But anyway, here's our integrated rate laws. And they tell you how the concentration should evolve with time. All right. Now, from lecture, you know how to derive a rate law, right? How, how, how can I find k in a rate law and the order? the x. Well, k is equal to the slope, correct? Well, if, if yeah, that, well, it's related to the slope. It's not equal, but. Right, okay, yes, related yeah, to the slope. Yeah, okay, so let me rephrase my question. In lecture, when you were introduced to this rate law, how did you find the X, for example. That power dependency. Do you remember? Maybe not. Here in our lecture, does this- When you, about? I'm sorry, when you say X, do you mean the exponent or do you mean X like the coordinates on the graph? Uh, I mean the exponent, sorry. Okay, so for the exponent, I mean, at least what we learned just the other day, if it's, if the line is linear on a graph where you're taking the natural log, then it's always first order. Is that what yep. you're talking about? Okay. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, oh wait, okay. <laughs> are like rates on top of each other and like compared them basically. Yeah, so what you did okay. in lecture the first thing I think you did was you looked at a series of experiments. Remember? Experiment one, two, three, where they change the initial concentrations and the rate changes. 
You remember? Yeah. Yeah. And so from this, for example, uh, I can use uh, the ratio of the rate laws to find X, or I could use what I call the eyeball method, where you say, okay, well, this is uh, two times, double the concentration, and the rate went up by four times. So I know that that kind of behavior uh, means that the rate equals K times the concentration of A squared. It's a second order effect. So I had determined X, right? Do you remember that from lecture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, you guys are just learning this. So I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised you don't remember, but this is the first thing that you were probably introduced in lecture. And then you can find K once you know the uh, X in this case, the power dependency, then you can use any one of the rates in this spot with their corresponding concentration here, you know two, and then you can solve for K for each uh, one of these. And then you can find K average. You know, they're all gonna be pretty close. Or you could just do it once and say, hey, it's about that much. All right. Now, having said that, that's just a review from your lecture. Uh, another way to find K and the X value or the power dependency of concentration on rate, to find that, we can use what I call the graphical method. And that's what you're going to use in lab. So th this is another way to find um, the, the, the rate law is using the graphical method, but you have to understand what the integrated rate laws are to use the graphical method, because that's the key. Uh, so how does that work? Let me get a new slide here. So if uh, again, if I have some A going to B, then I know the rate law has this form of a to some x. And I know what all those integrated rate laws uh, look like, right? We didn't derive them, but I know what the relationship is. I know that, um, I know how the concentration is gonna evolve in time based off of x, at least for three cases. Uh, and they're the most popular cases in Chem 201. It's zero, first, and second order. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so how do I find K and X using the graphical method? Well, the only thing that you need for this method, you don't need a series of experiments like we looked at one, two, three, four. All you need is what is provided in that Excel spreadsheet data, namely time and concentration. Just one experiment, right? As time goes on, concentration gets smaller and, and you saw it in that uh, data sheet you were given in Excel. So what you can do is analyze it uh, like they had you do. They had you take the log of the concentration and generate a column for that and one over concentration and generate those data points. Now, anybody out there, why do you think they have you do LN concentration and one over concentration. Well, that's the form of the half lives or whatever. No, that's the form of the integrated rate law. Yeah, sorry, sorry, the integrated rate law. Yeah, the see, half life is only one point in time. Yeah, yeah, it's, never mind. Sorry. Yeah, it's defined as the time it takes to cut that initial concentration in half. It's one point. Okay, but this is all the points. So what they do now to, to, you know, if you have this experimental data, 
they work backwards and they say, well, geez, it could be any of these. Uh, I mean, this could be zero, one, two, or anything, but I can check using the graphical method for these three because I know how they should behave in time as the reaction takes place because I have the integrated rate law and it tells me how they behave. So all I need to do is make three plots, concentration versus time, plot the log of the concentration versus time, and plot one over concentration versus time, and see which one comes out linear. That's going to indicate how it behaves. And through my knowledge and connection with the integrated rate law, um, I can find out what X is. So what you guys that did- That comes out linear is the one that which is like which order it is. Yes, because it's behaving like it should for that order. <clears throat> because for, for example, for a first order, um, the log of the concentration versus time should give you a straight function. And that's what you found with the, the data that you had. So. I think um, the, the concentration versus time was, was something like this. Uh, this guy was something like that. And then uh, this guy was something like that. So these two are obviously not linear, but this one is. And that's what the integrated rate law for first order says it should be if X is one. So back to the question, back on number eight, B, what's the order of the reaction and why? And First make sure. Order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now. I know, huh? Jeez. Five we hours. Got ago. There. <laughs> <laughs> so um it's first order because its graph is linear, basically. <clears throat> and that's what the integrated rate law says should happen for a first order relationship. Right? So it wants you to tie it into the integrated rate laws. You know, why did you think to plot log of concentration? Why do you plot one over concentration? Why? Because that's what the integrated rate laws say that behavior should be for, for those, right? And, and see, it's kind of tough for you guys because you don't know calculus and you didn't integrate these over here to derive these. So it's, there's a disconnect between the two. Um, and also maybe some of you guys should brush up on the equations of a line, you know, and what these things mean, um, you know, how you can relate them to Y equals MX plus B and so forth. Uh, all right. Um, so anyway, uh, Excel is good at, you know, giving you equations for a line. So Excel is going to say Y equals, then it's going to give you some number representing the slope plus another number representing uh, the y-intercept. Well, a lot of times in science, when we make these plots, we can attribute meaning to these numbers. And in this case, the slope of this line, like someone said out there, was related to, anybody? K. Okay. Yeah. And the intercept here, B, is related to what? Uh, the initial concentration. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, one, the first thing we can conclude by doing this is we can say whether that power dependency in our rate law is zero first or second, or it's not. Say I didn't get any um, 
say there wasn't any uh, linear function here, then my conclusion would be, well, then it's not zero first or second order, it's something else. But in your case, uh, the log of the concentration came out. And so it is um, first order. Furthermore, I can see here in this equation for first order, y equals m x plus b that this term here equals b x equals t minus k equals m the slope and y equals ln the concentration of t now up here i snuck in i don't know if you've seen this right here i snuck in the equation of your your line for the log of the concentration uh, versus time the one that came out linear for your data. So now, um, I think I'm done with B and I can go on to C where it asks you to, to identify what is K. We know what X is now, we know it's first order because when we plot the log of the concentration versus time, we get a linear function. And that's what the integrated rate law says it should be for first order. Right, so that's B, that's the answer to B. Any questions on B? Okay, All, right. All right, great. Okay, C, uh, using the appropriate equation, the linear one, identify the specific rate constant K for this decomposition, carefully explain and demonstrate how you have done this and determine the K value and units. All right. So I use my knowledge in uh, math and functions of a line, y equals mx plus b. And I don't have to do any calculations. I, it's more of an identification. So I see here in this relationship over here for first order that the slope of the line should equal what? That it should equal 0 0.0714. Well, no. Oh, is that is that the other? Oh, the That's slope close. Of the line negative it's, k. It's almost it's almost right. I look at this. Let's take it step by step here. I look at this relationship and I see that m the slope here, is negative. Write, yeah, thank you, equals minus K. And so what is the slope? I look over here, because Excel gives it to me. It's minus 0 0.0714. So what does K equal? 0.0714. Yeah, awesome. And um, what's the units of K? Well, I, I have it written in my equation, but how would you figure that out? You just have to cancel out the units. So in this case, it would be one over X or seconds to the minus one. Yeah, right. So remember, here it is right here for first order. It's one over seconds. There's another way though to find the units of K for this case. We have a plot of the log of the concentration right here versus time, and it came out linear. I know the units for the slope is gonna be rise or run or change in Y over the change in X. What's the units on the Y axis? What's the units for the y-axis? Smaller. No, it's nothing. No units. Whenever you take the log oh, of something. Oh, because it's log. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And so what's the units on the, the um, x-axis? Time. Seconds. Time. Time. Seconds. Right. So it comes out the same. So either way, you get the right units for k. It's the units of the slope. Uh, so you can do one way and check it the other. 
So wait, are the units units of k seconds or one over seconds? One over seconds. If it was seconds, uh, then you wouldn't get rate. Yeah. Uh, in, okay. That's the units that you you want, right? Because you got rate has to be molarities per second. Yeah. So k has to be one over seconds because it's first order, and we're going to come in with a molarity here. Uh -huh whatever that concentration of A is. Okay. All right, awesome. Any other questions? So I think that's it for C, right? So we got A, B, C. Uh-oh, uh Pepperoncini's pissed off. Hey. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, anyway. Uh, we're done, number eight, A, B, and C. And D, uh, you can waffle on that. It's just, uh, you know, there's no wrong answer for D and eight. All right. So uh, what do I want to do now that I, I'm done talking about the report? I guess we should go look at... Um, let's go back here to Canvas and take a look at some of the other stuff that you have to do to prepare for, for our first meeting on Monday. Uh, you have to go through the uh, safety videos and pre-lab videos and so forth. These are really good things. Even if you've had a lot of experience in, in Chem 152 and 200, just to brush up some of the, the important points for how to use an analytical balance, the volumetric pipette and uh, you know techniques, not blowing out that final drop and so forth. The spectrophotometer, which we're gonna use in, in the first lab, uh, the kinetics lab. Um, we're not going to do it on Monday, but on, on Wednesday, we're going to use the spectrophotometer. So it's, it's good to uh, brush up on that. Uh, how to prepare a burette for titration. You, many of you guys are probably experts or you think you're experts in, in titrating. Well, we're going to do a lot more titrating in this class. Um, and so it's, it's uh, worth a, a look at this to uh, really fine tune your expertise in using a burette for titration. Uh, and then, you know, how to read a burette's pretty important because you have to read it to the hundredth place. And so once you view those, and I, I think they're like, I don't know, five minutes on average each video. So it's, it's not gonna take you uh, very long to do that. Um, after you're done that, though you should go back and take this quiz. And it's not gonna go to your, your grade, but it's, it's, it's gonna um, point out a lot of the sticky points that you know, students forget or, or um, should be aware of. You know, like, like how far can you read an analytical balance to, what place, uh, what affects balances, how to clean them, uh, and then the parallax error and, and all these things that are important for getting accurate readings uh, in lab. Uh, so you should take a look at this and try it, see how well you do, and, and then find out if you get any wrong, find out what's, what the deal is. Uh, all right. That won't take you very long. It's only 12 uh, questions. So now we have an equipment video in case you need to be uh, refreshed on uh, what the different equipment look like and what their names are. The volumetric flask, Bunsen burner, uh, beaker, you know, that kind of stuff. And the ACS safety video, you may have seen this in 152 and 200. Uh, this will refresh your memory of, of the safety procedures uh, in lab. 
But when we get into lab on Monday, I'm going to customize our safety uh, um, instructions. I'm going to show you where the shower is, how to use the eye wash, where the fire extinguisher is, how to call 911 and that kind of stuff. So I'll customize it when we get in lab on Monday. Uh, but that's it. That's, you know, pretty much it. And um, I don't know. Are there any questions on anything? Professor, so for Monday, we just need to read about introduction to experimental statistics. Is that what we're doing? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, okay. Do you have the schedule? Not in front of me, I don't. Okay, now we used to do introduction to experimental statistics next, but because of this, uh, two week period that we're kind of um, not in lab, I decided to cut that out and take our time going through this material. Um, and, and that way it just gives us more time. So uh, according to our schedule, which I suggest that you print out and tack to your wall, uh, what we're going to do is check in an equilibrium part A. So you might want to look through your equilibrium part A stuff for Monday. You're going to. So where where is that in the lab notebook? Because I don't. See. What the schedule? No, not the schedule. The equilibrium oh, part oh, A. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's um, okay. Equilibrium experiment. Yeah. Okay. That is on page. 37. That's where it starts. Oh, okay. I didn't go back far enough. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. So you can read through that. Uh, and, and it's a little ahead, but equilibrium is the second chapter that we're going to look at. And then uh, part A of that is on page 40. Uh, we're going to do A1 and A2. And that goes on to page 41. So 40 to 41. It's just a small little piece in your lab manual. Okay, thank you. I was just confused. I didn't realize you were skipping that. Yeah, so yeah, All right, um, thank you. thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably not the only one, but we, we skipped that lab in your lab manual. Um, but you can read through it if you want this uh, experimental statistics. It talks about standard deviation uh, and relative standard deviation and how we can use some of these terms, these statistics terms to uh, add a precision discussion to our analysis. Um, yeah, so anywho, uh, any questions on anything else? I don't think so. Awesome guys, thanks for, for uh, coming and I'll, I'm excited to see you on Monday. Don't we still have lecture? Um, no, uh, lecture, you mean lecture today? Yeah. No, uh, lecture today I had to cancel um, because of this as uh, administration stuff. But anyway, uh, for lecture, um, you know, I could cancel this. Uh, for lecture, what I want to do is just have you look at th the previous lectures mm -hmm. uh, and come to lecture on Monday with questions. Uh, okay. Okay, see Matt. All right, see you later.